Well, thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you today and share some experiences. Just going to be talking about the PowerPoint here. Uh, and uh, just a little bit of background, I actually started my career on the finance side, accounting side, worked for a CPA firm that did a lot of water audits and uh, auditing work and, and uh, other kinds of accounting work for water districts and water companies, both for-profit and so forth. So I took a job after about 10 years as a controller for a water agency, wa doing both sewer and, and uh, retail water, retail sewer, retail water. And after five years, the general manager asked me to go out into operations. And I said, well, now, what do you want an accountant at in operations? Lots of good, strong technical people, but we need some help from a, a budgeting and, even more importantly, an organizational standpoint. So it's really kind of a fascinating fascination opportunity for me on, on broadening my horizons and experiences. Been a general manager for now about 11 years. And, in, and uh, most of these experiences that I've had have centered around how to to get more out of the, the limited resources or the fixed resources, both, of course, infrastructure, funding, but most importantly on the employment uh, labor resource. And you're going to hear a little bit in a few minutes about one of our uh, master plan activities on how to think about some of this. But want to first start with culture. And what is culture? How do we measure culture, if that's possible? How do we improve culture? So obviously we'll kind of click through some of these slides here. They, they move uh, slowly if you want to keep moving through. Components of performance for individuals and organizations and structures have many components, uh, talent, obviously attitude, motivation, skills, knowledge. Some things are, are able to be um, modified in a shorter term, other things we bring with us. How do we structure ourselves? How do we communicate with employees? How do we make changes? if first we determine that change is necessary and what we want to change. So let's go to the next slide and talk about cu culture. Culture is a shared belief or beliefs and values guiding the thinking and behavioral styles of our members. It kind of tells us what is normal. Some of this is intuitive and, and said out loud or not said out loud, some is. It kind of guides us, again, maybe indirectly in how decisions get made when we're not there, when certain people within the organization aren't there. It's the way we do things around here. It's how people will act under pressure, especially in, 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 in difficult situations. It's kind of the glue that holds the organization together. I looked up in the dictionary, too, uh, other definitions. It's artistic and intellectual pursuits. Another definition is the development of the mind. So let's go on. So why do we need to think about culture? Well, just to flip through these, won't spend a lot of time. Obviously, we're in a difficult time. Uh, whether we are or not, though, we always hope to get more out of and improve and bring in new ways of doing things. But with the economy, some of the things that have been happening lately with some decisions that others have made that do that put pressure on us, uh, pension systems and uh, aging infrastructure, success, succession planning, conservation and revenues and so forth. But bigger picture here is what do we do to a culture to make ourselves part of a plan or an activity to make the world better around us? I had a good question to last me. Are we sure we want to make change? Why do we want to make change? Let's go to the next slide. So if we kind of flip through this here. Jill brought in a great little cartoon here. We're ready to begin the next phase of keeping things exactly the way we are. But the great question we had in the last meeting is, why do you want to make change? We certainly don't want to make change for change's sake, right? Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about kind of bookends of culture. I'll keep flipping through here. So on the first, defensive cultures. You know, this is kind of the worst case, if you will. We don't want to change things here. We focus problems on others. We, we just find the way we are. Leave us alone. We see that what we do is more important than what others do, that defensive or inactive culture. Uh, construction, constructive culture, kind of the other end, the proactive, very innovative. We're looking forward to, to doing things uh, to make the world better, reinforcing personal responsibility and accountability, doing that at the individual level, not because we have to, because we want to, uh, the value of our performance. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the, the things we're going to talk about here in a minute is some tools to try to measure culture. It's not absolute, of course, a, a very difficult thing to quantify. One study here, though, Carter and Heskett had done a study of over 207 firms a lot of these were uh, Fortune 500 for profit, and looking into their culture and looking into their performance SEC records, you see this uh, kind of the one bookend again, a non-adaptive, uh, non-performance, um, some might call it very bureaucratic kind of culture. 
versus in the red, versus on the blue, the adaptive performance enhanced culture. And the numbers themselves, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, uh, maybe not as important how they calculate it, but rather the difference, especially in the bottom, li uh, bottom line. Why is that? Well, if you imagine if we can get every employee or a lot more of our employees thinking about their piece of the puzzle, what they do, looking to find uh, problems with solutions, right? Looking to make the world, their world a better place, getting more enjoyment and satisfaction out of the world. Many of us have felt this in cultures that we've been involved with. Maybe it's a different a church group or a, uh, a civic organization we're involved with. You feel that energy. And, and so I think that's what we're talking about is how to, how to understand that culture, where it stands, kind of a baseline, and whether or not we can improve it. Let's go to the next slide. So, in fact, let's go, I want, I'll come back to the slide in a minute. This, this, uh, let's go on to there. Okay, so let's talk about how to measure. This circumplex has been around for some time, human uh, synergistics you see at the bottom, trying to look at three broad categories, of four categories each. Uh, let's start with the red, again, the kind of the, the worst bookend culture, dominated by perfectionism, uh, competitiveness, power, uh, domination, if you will, oppositional, you know, how, how can we measure a culture to get a sense of if these traits or these styles are more aggressive or more dominant? And we're going to show you some measurements next. But in the green, this is kind of the, the middle of the road or the passive avoidance, you know, dependent on someone else. Uh, conventional is the way we've always done it. Wait for approval. I wasn't told to do it, okay? Probably where a lot of organizations might center more. And then blue is maybe, again, the, the perfect or the uh, other bookend of the perfect world, all achievement-based and self-actualizing. I know what I can do. I'm going to get excited. I'm going to excite you, uh, whether whatever part of the vertical structure we're in. Humanistic, encouraging, affiliative. This is, uh, again, the perfect world. So going to the next slide, we then took a tool. There, there are tools out there. It's basically a survey. For a written form that we did for all of our 85 employees at the time, this is about five years ago, and contrasted it to 653 other organizations that have taken such a survey. And this was our baseline, again, five years ago. So Western Municipal Water District, I was kind of excited to see the large, large blue there, uh, but little, uh, now why do we have so much red and, and so much green? Uh, but it, it, when I first started the organization seven years ago, one of my board members commented in his words the organization was a mausoleum, you know, and that's exactly how I felt when I first came to the, to the district. Everybody was doing their job, but they kept their head down. They didn't speak unless spoken to. You asked them a question. It was a very, uh, very quiet, very closed down culture. So this was about two years into doing, starting to do some things. Why did I want to see change? Not because change needed to happen, but because we had a hundred things we needed to do, uh, a lot of tasks and issues. So when I talk to the board about why, what do we want to do with our employees, let's, let's dream for a minute. If we could have all of our employees 20% magically, 20% more productive on an $11 million um, as labor and, and benefit budget, you know, if you try to quantify. Now, where did that 20% number? Well, you've got to start somewhere. But the idea that if we could create a culture that would get people more excited about their piece, it, would it have value? So let's go to the next slide. This was the 11 executive manager, management team, manager, excuse me, managers, how they saw the world. And you see, we'll flip back again in a second, but this might be what is possible. They, they're thinking, well, this is great. We're very achievement-oriented and self-actualized and, and very encouraging and not very competitive and, and no avoidance. Let's flip backwards one slide. But our employees saw it very differently. So that became what I would say the, the gap, because if this was the first analysis, we're going to do another one in about six months. We'll have our first baseline to after five years of work. But this presented the delta originally, which was what our employees see. And there's a lot here then that we had to start looking at and versus what the managers saw. OK, let's go to the next slide. So communication. We've been talking with employees. Uh, and one of the things that came out clearly at the beginning was, well, we're not sure what our part is of what the district does. All right, well, here's our mission, probably very similar to everyone's mission, right? Water supply, disposal, resources in a public, safe, public manner, reliable, environmentally sensitive, financially responsible. Let's flip to the next slide. But as we started thinking about what the messaging is about what we, who we are, what we do, what we value, and what the employees 
portion of this might be, right, or sub-portion, we started talking about a vision statement. This starts talking about change now, to transform into a regional water resource leader, integrating the best in business processes and business systems, right? Leading edge workforce, continuous, continuously creating greater efficiencies and value for our customers. The same time we did this initial assessment five years ago, we were working with our board of directors on a strategic plan. And interestingly enough, when we got to values, which we're going to see at the next slide, and we started talking about these kinds of issues, it wasn't something they were, that clicked with them, that they, they had a lot of discussion about. Let's flip to the next slide. And when we started talking about values, who we are. I, as an employee, care about this. I know my employees care about these things. You know, safety, obviously very important. Teamwork, performance-based, I want to be recognized for what I do. Some are more excited about change, efficiency, innovation, effectiveness. Many want to be, have the opportunity for training and development. But we, through the spectrum of things, we, we found that our elected officials and board almost saw this as a, yeah, yeah, that's detail, you know, I'm sure it's important. But we saw, again, a kind of a gap in, our, in how we valued our employees as, as a as group of management team versus our board. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this, so let me, let me finish that thought, and then we'll talk about this slide. So what, what I think became very apparent at that point in time is there was things to do, things to work on, and we started talking to our employees. We had some small group, uh, focus groups of vertical parts of the organization as well as horizontal parts of the organization. And we started getting good feedback and good comments. And they started asking questions about kind of what my part is, and they made recommendations on things that were broken. And I'll tell you, looking back five years from, from then, now, today, we realized we didn't do a lot of organizing our thoughts in terms of communicating back, communicating back to the employees. And I'm going to talk a minute about the new, what we're working on now, and how that's coming to bear. But I think in all of us looking at our structures, it goes, though, to some context. This is another organization uh, that has a much greener and a lot more red in the aggressive defensive structure and a lot less blue. So it represents a lot farther to go possibly to the perfect bookend, but it isn't about context to other organizations, it's about where we are today and where we want to go, right? So it doesn't really matter how your graph turns out after the test, it just gives you some information about some of the things that you need to work on. So why would there be a high oppositional, high avoidance? Probably, one might imagine, there are maybe <coughs> things happening uh, where there's a big disconnect between management and employees, Maybe it's within employee uh, performance evaluations or communication. I know we had a challenge with a, a supervisor that uh, took us a while to figure out was getting things coming at him, but he would say, my perfect world is not to ever hear from you again. Don't bring me your problems. You know, our, our role in operations is not to send anything on to management, that our perfect world is to be totally under the radar. Well, that creates frustration over time, and we've all had those kinds of experiences. Let's go to the next slide. So again, uh, two different perspectives. I want to I keep enough time for Q&A, so let's go to the next slide. So we can recognize the things we don't want to be. You know, we've all seen, and some might call it bureaucracy, but you know, let's not rock, rock the boat here. That's not our job. Let's get our head down. Things are good. I got enough to do. I want to get out of here at 5. Uh, tell people different things to avoid conflict. Somebody brings you a problem, you give them a nice little answer. Someone else brings you another piece of it, you tell them so, something totally differently. Now, that, doesn't, that it probably doesn't matter. It matters. It probably happens both at management level, at employee level, again, vertically or horizontally. Uh, but it's not an example of a very constructive culture. Hey, the, you know, this is the policy. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I can't do it, you know. Uh, treat the rules as more important than the ideas or the, or the problems to be solved. Uh, lay low when things get tough. You know, um, I don't know what to tell you, but I, it's not my problem. And they're, they're not solution oriented. Let's go to the next slide. So contrasting to five ways to increase the culture or uh, make a more positive environment, positive rewards to, to other people. We have a, almost a complete merit-based uh, performance system. In other words, we don't have step increases, those kinds of things. We have a COLA typically in the contract that's fairly small. But otherwise, promotions and increases come through our evaluation and are all merit-based. 
That was a tough situation, by the way, in the last couple of years of the economy because we're, the board had discretion over that program and they cut it out. And we felt that pain for the last, last couple of years. Uh, one of the other things we're dealing with is underperformers. We call them PIPs or performance, and value, uh, and performance improvement plans, whereby we're also dealing with the tough situations where people are underperforming because we've heard from employees that one of the toughest things to do is work your tail off and somebody next to you is doing nothing, or not, they, in the, at least in their eyes, and is rewarded the same or they're not rewarded anymore. So positive rewards, think in, be encouraged to think in unique, independent ways, step outside the bureaucracy, help others think for themselves, teamwork, enjoy their, the people enjoy their work. And this is one of the, the biggest areas of improvement that we have worked on and have a ways to go, is that vertical, involving subordinates in the decisions. And we'll talk about some of the uh, performance evaluation systems as well. All right, so how does culture impact our ability to meet the needs of our stakeholders? Obviously, uh, we have customer service. We have uh, challenges from within the community, not just at the customer level and, and politically, uh, you know, within the civic organizations and so forth. You can see in a structure like this, if the goal is to, uh, you know, there's a lot of opposition avoidance, it makes it difficult. How does culture impact performance engagement of our staff? Uh, and we, and you, you call it the blue culture. I really like that, you know, to encourage that and get to that actual blue culture allows for, for a lot more engagement to solve problems. Next slide. So I won't spend a lot of time on this. Let's just kind of flip through this. But we, we developed kind of a, a schematic of how we think about And this should really be in a circular form. We assessed our current state. We really try and do this each year in the budget and in our business plan. But it starts with vision and, and aligning leadership, vision and communication. Not necessarily vertically top down, but if leadership is not, no, doesn't know, what, unless leadership has a clear vision where it wants to go and communicates that, it's very hard to move on anywhere else on this graphic. So we want to build that cultural consensus. That means interaction with employees. It's not a one-way street. It's not top down. And then rewarding behavior. There may be monetary, maybe other ways, but it means that we, we recognize when people are stepping up and we reward or recognize that behavior. If people don't get feedback, we know where we're going, here's how we want to change, you're making the change and they hear nothing, it's not going to be very fruitful. And future state, well, that's where it becomes more circular. Leadership is the foundation. It has to start with that, that vision, that common understanding. The vision, mission, value, strategy all have to be aligned. I don't know if there's one more bar in there or not. And then building, so then this is kind of the product. I don't know if I really like this graphic, but th this green bar represents when we're moving towards that enhanced culture that we're seeing the product, we're seeing the... I'll tell you one quick example. We have what we call our best program. I mean, many of us do this. <clears throat> we encourage submittals by employees, oftentimes it comes from supervisors, on really interesting work. And then we actually have a pool of funding that we provide, we have a scale, we provide uh, sometimes as much as $5,000, and that's pretty rare, but on a, on a large idea. Many of them are $100 and $500. But ideas, and it's amazing what employees generate after they think about this for a couple years. And we have to screen and say, well, if this is part of your job, you know, and this is what's expected, but things they've done on traffic coning, things they've done on uh, uh, en enhancements of the wastewater process, uh, above and beyond. And we have a group of, of employees that are from management and staff that review these proposals and make recommendations ultimately to the general manager and then we bring them in front of the board. So ideas like that, it's part of the, the reward value based behavior. But I'll tell you, they've done this now for the fourth year and the ideas that start coming after two or three or four years are, are really pretty, pretty amazing. Let's go to the next slide. So many of us kind of bring this to the highest level. Many of us have done a lot of master planning. We do a water source master plan, an urban water management plan. We do an integrated resource plan. We do a development master plan. Looks at fees and infrastructure like tanks and reservoirs for the distribution system. We've done an IT master plan. We, about six years ago, developed a 10-year vision of what we want to do with IT. And so we've changed out our billing system and our, our uh, enterprise uh, financial system. We've changed to our second generation of CWMS. We've changed out our GIS system. But the point of all these master plans is we look at 
concepts and resources and commitments and visions and destinations, milestones, schedules for a myriad of parts of our organization, but we haven't done it, we call the human capital, we got a lot of feedback today, it sounds cold. We haven't done it for our employment force and our benefits, but it's more than that. I mean, we have MOUs, we have contract negotiations, and those are cyclical, some are short, some agencies have two or three year cycles, some have longer, but this is about thinking about it much more holistically, including not just our employment force and reliability, but our training systems, our succession planning. <coughs> but for me, it's about speaking to my elected board to talk about as important it is to build infrastructure, maintain infrastructure. Uh, you know, you don't like this term. This is kind of an infrastructure. This is our most important asset. We can't get anything done without our employees. And we can get a lot more done with a really empowered culture. So we're starting to change our vernacular to much longer time frames about what we want to do in five, seven, and 10 years. And when we adopt these plans, it gives us guidance into the next year's budget, and the year after budget, on, and resource allocations and, and efforts and activities. So we're in the midst of finalizing our phase one human capital plan. I call it our master plan for our, our employment force. And one of the aspects of it when we first started was the consultant said to me, now are you ready when we launch into this that as we get feedback from the employees of what's working, what isn't working, the good, bad, and the ugly, to feed back to them. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, we've already done some preliminary interviews of employees, and one of the things they've said is you're doing a lot of things, but you've asked questions of them in the past, and they th she threw a number out, like 20%. She said, but it, the employees tend to feel that you've only got back to them with like maybe one out of five ideas. Are you prepared this time to really give them, and some, some answers will be we can't work on that right now, or we don't have the money. But are you ready to, to communicate and feedback because this is a two-way street? The confidence or more satisfaction comes from people knowing that you're listening and you're dealing with things realistically. They may like some of your answers, they may not. But the worst case scenario in her mind, at least from her perspective, was no, no response, no feedback when people are, are giving you honest. So eventually they're going to shut down. They're going to stop answering your questions. Ah, here they come again. Something else, a couple other things that came out of the plan was a tighter, they wanted tighter definitions and role responsibilities, job descriptions. One comment was, we're not sure who the leaders are. I'm still not sure. I want to learn more about what that comment meant. Well, we have an org chart, right? We have job descriptions. We have managers and supervisors. What does that mean? Does it mean they're hearing different things from different managers or management within the organization? We shall see. We have pretty uh, broad job descriptions because we've loved the cross-training aspects of having broad descriptions. People can move more within the organization as, as well, but I think maybe we're seeing now a trend the other way. We want a little cl more clarity on what we're supposed to be doing and what's important for us to work on. Makes sense. Climate that encourages honest feedback, bi-directional, that's not always fun or easy, you know? It's not, but, but if we want this culture, if we want people to feel empowered, it's gonna be critical. Communicate, 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 and Jill's gonna talk about some of those methods, but uh, that, that master plan, I think we're probably three or four months away for hopefully bringing it to our board and adopting, but it's, uh, it's been a, a really interesting path so far. We're about four or five months into it. And then about six months from now, we're intending to do our circumplex, circumplex analysis again to see what's happened in five years. I'd be happy to share that. Uh, I'm sure hoping there's more blue, but we're going to find out. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jill. Communications planning. Um, if the key is to communication, to communicate, 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 it's very important to figure out what that means and maybe provide some tools and understanding of what successful communications look like and what they aren't. Um, John said a little bit about himself. He comes from the financial world. I come from the operations world and uh, have 
uh, both operations and engineering background, neither of which are necessarily conducive to really excellent communications. Um, so it, tools are a good thing. It's always good to have some tools. And one thing um, I had to do as a uh, new GM in the last few years was to come up with some pieces to present my board with a plan for how I was going to improve communications. They didn't just want to hear, I'm going to work on it and communicate, communicate. They wanted to hear, well, what does that mean and what are you doing? And what else are you going to do? Every time I finish one and get it implemented, it's like, well, and now what? You know. So these are some of the things we've implemented so far. One was um, we started all employee meetings at all the facilities, and we do that every other month. Um, we have a, an office building, we have three treatment plants, and we have a, um, a maintenance group that meets in our maintenance facility, and they start work earlier. So that means when I say all employee meetings, it, I go out as the GM and conduct five meetings in each of these five places, starting with the maintenance guys when they actually show up, and I actually let them talk in their, in their area. But also to encourage employees to talk to each other, all of the all employee meetings are open to all of the employees. They just need their supervisor's permission to show up at one of the other locales. They don't have to go to the one in their location. So if they want to hear what the maintenance guys are saying, they just come to the maintenance meeting as long as their supervisor says, yeah, you can fit it into your work schedule. So we've left those pretty open. Another thing we do is a quarterly employee newsletter. This gives us an um, opportunity to um, enhance the blue culture that we like to talk about. So we do a, every month we name an employee of the month and it's very often based on um, a blue sighting if you will. That they've done something really good or they're just the guy everybody wants to work with because they're the one who picks up the extra slack or they're the operator everybody wants to follow because they leave the plant in good shape or whatever it is. You know, they're, The recommendations are always different and um, they get selected by a committee that's been formed and they get um, not just their name on a plaque because some people like that and some people don't, they um, also get a day off which in our organization means you either get the day off or you can trade it in so it's money or day depending on which way you want it so it's a, something real that they are rewarded with and when we announce who the employee of the month was we say for this blue action and we describe it and reinforce what those blue actions might be um, and then we also give them a, a little bit of a write-up in our quarterly employee newsletter so it, it's like a double hit a lot of good um, blue encouragement, if you will. I also do weekly reports to my um, elected board members and say this is what happened in the utility over the last week. And um, had been doing that for a while, but then as part of the communications plan, began sharing those with all employees so that they saw how their p their little piece of the puzzle fits into the overall organization and what's being told to the board so they can and I try to vary what I'm reporting each month so that everybody's little sections or projects or whatever are mentioned from time to time and I think that that gives everybody a sense of pride and sense of how they fit into the overall organization. We've also added management suggestion boxes. Next to our safety suggestion boxes we have um, a management box and you can either throw in gripes or suggestions or just general comments or whatever and then we try to respond to those. It isn't just one way. It's um, very often anonymous. They're certainly allowed to sign them but most people prefer the boxes um, as an alternative where they don't aren't known. So it might be everything from why don't you turn off the lights at the treatment plant when nobody's there to um, hey we have an idea for another energy savings, we have an idea that maybe this supervisor isn't doing a good job or why don't we have another position to help us with SOPs or it can be all kinds of things. And what we do is we take all of those comments and suggestions, um, come up with answers to all of them. We distribute them at the all employee meetings. I highlight the ones that were submitted in that facility because they're boxes and fixed locations. We know where they came in even if we don't know who they're from. And reopen that for any Q&A in case we miss the point because they all know what each other meant by putting this in. Believe me, there's a lot of uh, 
rumors and gossip, and everybody tends to know what's going on. Um, we also formed a, a pair of teams, if you will. One is what we call a management advisory team, or MAT, and the other is a staff advisory team, or SAT. And what they do is um, the MAT and SAT, one is made up of all supervisors and managers. So if we have something like uh, some suggestion that came in the management box and we don't know what to do with it, we might go out to them and say, hey, do you have some ideas? What, do you, what does this even mean? And they say, oh, recycling extra pipe. Yeah, well, we had some questions about that and they might have the input of what to do about it. And the staff, because they're all line staff, give another perspective on the agency and they might say, hey, you know, we've heard that there's real problems with the way the supervisors are falling behind again on performance plans or evaluations and what can you do about that and can you reinforce that or something. So we meet with those two teams every month and it's been extremely uh, collegial because in that team it's, nobody has ever um, blamed or um, yelled at or dropped out of the team or anything for any issue that they raise. It's very, it's been very healthy, I think, to allow opportunities for communication again. So, um, one of the things we've learned is also we brought in consultants to help us because this wasn't intuitive to us that there are different kinds of styles in this world, and as you think about it, some of these styles will sound familiar to you. So I know that person. Anyway, DISC is the four basic styles. D stands for direct, um, I for intuitive or influence, S for stable or steady, and C for cautious. We'll get into each of those in more detail. But um, this shows that it, it's kind of a, a circle, just like the circumplex, that everybody probably has a little bit of everything. You know, sometimes you can make snap decisions, be very direct, pragmatic, and other times you might want to be more cautious. And I, I can use the example if I'm doing a, a quick purchase on the way out of the grocery store and I see a piece of candy that I just got to have. It's not a big decision. I just do it. I just, you know, uh, very decisive I can be when faced with chocolate. On the other hand, if I need to buy a new car, it's a bigger investment, there's a higher risk in terms of my pocketbook, and I might take more time to analyze or evaluate, plan, you know, and, and so the, everybody has a little bit of all of these, but in terms of their personalities, some people are more comfortable with that I, having the process to explain what's going on, being able to do a gut reaction. Or they're more comfortable with the S, avoiding conflict at all costs, because they just don't like conflict. So what, um, in terms of the different factors of how they deal with the world, world um, a decisive person, again, makes decisions quickly, and they're willing to take a little risk. With that chocolate, I don't think it's a lot of risk, you know? I'm very D when it comes to chocolate. Uh, trust, immediate, in a limited way. I can trust that that chocolate's going to be good and just snap it up. What do I fear most? It, it might be something that I'm taking, taking advantage of. Why did I grab that bar when I could get two for one on this other for the same price? But, you know, just to use some silly examples. A person who has a dominant D really needs direct communication. They don't like a lot of fluff. They want it to be straight out. A dominant I? Sorry for the uh, poor lineup here. Apparently the columns didn't work perfectly, but decisions can be based on what feels right. Uh, I know it in my gut. This is the right thing to do. Trust. They tend to trust everything a little bit more. Their fear is very different. It's a loss of social approval or rejection, and that drives, you know, fears and trust and decision making you know, are driven by this style. Um, needs. Optimistic environment. Um, they like to have a happy culture around them. They want to be liked and included. They want to be one of the gang. So that would be a dominant eye. And again, everybody has these pieces within their own personality. So when instead of choosing chocolate or a car, I'm choosing what dress to wear to my husband's event, I might be using an eye. Oh, I'm going to use this because I don't want them to think that I'm in jeans all the time, I might actually have to put on a dress kind of decision-making, the fear of social approval. 
S. These are based on trust and consensus. Trust is earned but open. Um, biggest fear, instability, lack of security. Um, a lot of us in the public sector are in the public sector because of the security of the jobs. Not all of us, but it's something that's more common, I think, in the public sector than in some of the startups, for instance. Need. They want to be able to trust their manager. They want to know there's good management. And they also need to change slowly. It's just, you know, the way they're most comfortable. And that doesn't mean they can't do other things. And again, this is, everything is in all of us. None of us is 100% anything. Last is C. Um, critical thinking. Decisions are based on facts. Trust can be earned, but it's not always easy. Their biggest fear? Criticism of their work. Need. Detail. I, explanation. Um, I can sometimes be very C at work. I think it comes from my engineering background. I can sometimes suffer, I admit it, from analysis paralysis. and uh, So people know this about me. This is one of the things about going through a process like this, we did it with all our supervisors and managers, so people now know how to deal with me, whether it's to dangle chocolate in front of me or, you know, on a decision-making standpoint, that if it's something that I'm um, maybe reluctant to do on the first round, they'll say, provide me with more facts, um, more detail, more explanation, and then they know that they're more likely to get to a point where I'm comfortable with that decision. Motivational principles. How do we motivate people? Everybody is motivated. It's just finding out what is motivating them. And the DISC helps us understand how communication can be used to motivate. But know that always that people are motivated. They aren't still laying in bed, you know. <laughs> it's like something got them out of bed, whether it was the paycheck or the fact that maybe they love the business. I just love water, so, you know, to me every day is exciting, and that's part of my motivation. Also know that people do things for their own reasons. I mean, not everybody has the same motivations. I each one of us is a little different, whether I have a public agency job because the hours are more normal and I have little kids and I want to know that I can really get home to them or whether I like this pa salary or the benefits or whether I do it because I'm passionate about water, water treatment and water sheds and all of that. But we all do have our own reasons and sometimes it's a lot of them. Um, it's always easier to motivate people through their strengths than it is to change their weaknesses. So if I have a higher comfort level with more facts, instead of yelling at me, oh, come on, just go with your gut, it's easier to just give me a few more facts kind of thing. And, and using, again, myself as an example, because hopefully that way people won't feel threatened. Uh, so DISC can be used to identify individual motivation and approaches to communicating. Sometimes there are shared traits. So D's and I's tend to be people-oriented, change-oriented, process-oriented, direct in their communication, and leaders through inspiration. Um, at Zone 7, we found that our operational group had a lot of D's. They were very comfortable making rapid decisions. Uh, they have to because the water's going through the plant or the, you know, fire hydrant's just been run over and they have to be out there making decisions quickly. And so they're very comfortable in their work life letting that D dominate. We found our HR group tended to be a lot of I's, again, in the work setting, that they're more comfortable thinking about a people-oriented solution and they want to build the social system and that they want to make sure that the processes are all in place and that communication is clear at all points. S's and C's tend to be task oriented, status quo oriented. Looking into the content rather than um, the, the show or the, it's, it's not just pretty, it's there's really some substance to it. Um, they can be indirect at times, which makes their communication sometimes difficult. Leaders by example. We found that S's and C's were very common in both our engineering group and in our finance group. Um, 
And maybe that's because of the kind of work they have to do, where they have to be more detail-oriented, more analysis. That's what we're expecting them to do on the job, to be a little more cautious. But it also can make it very frustrating for, say, our operations group that wants a quick decision to understand why our engineers are suffering analysis paralysis. Or vice versa, why our engineers who like to make sure that all the facts are there are hearing from the operators, oh, just build it. Well, we want to make sure that it's right. You know, they have this fear of being wrong. So understanding some of this about us as an organization and as individuals has helped us communicate and understand one another, even to break down some of the ivory towers between the different sections. Um, it's been an interesting road, shall we say. We don't do things alone at Zone 7. There's a lot of tools out there. there um, I put a couple websites here, and I know Cheryl will probably share them with you. But the organizational cultural inventory that uh, Circumplex is available online. Uh, there are also consultants that specialize in helping you facilitate that kind of study and survey. We, it's good to establish a baseline culture using the survey. That's what both of our organizations have done and then wait uh, some period of time. Five is probably reasonable. Two is probably s ridiculously optimistic um, and do a second survey so that you show improvement it's also not cheap, so you can't do it too often. Um, individual styles, again, the disk is something that I didn't make up. It actually exists out there. The privacy issues we ran into, we only ran um, the disk survey for our supervisors and managers. We had some pushback from the unions that they felt that this would um, somehow be a privacy issue. That being said, we, it was so consistent with the different work areas that it was definitely um, not something, once you understand, oh, these five people who happen to be our five engineering managers are all looking exactly the same, probably without even interviewing their staff or having the surveys, we could guess that that, that may pervade down through the group. So that kind of brings us to the end, and I can even put down your... How's that? One of, one of the things, if I could, I just want to add to, to Jill's talk, uh, discussion about the disk test. Oh, it's, not a, it's not a label. And it, it's not a pigeonhole. It's just an opportunity to have a little better understanding of why people react the way they do and or why and how they get motivated, what motivates them. In fact, let me just walk up, if I can write on the board for a second, and just give you an example of the results. As Jill said, it's not about absolute scores or any two people are alike, but on this scale of these four factors, mine, mine looks something like this. I care, uh, to be I care to be aggressive. I have more of aggressive decision-making personality and how I influence others and how others influence me, kind of the political, uh, kind of probably a good GM profile. Jill, I think yours you said was something the other direction? Yes. Something like this. Reverse. Engineer, a lot of you know, facts and details. Well, as she said, we move around a lot depending on what the issues are, but by understanding a little bit better about, and we've done the same for our supervisors and managers, uh, in fact, even new hires, we've tried to get a profile so we can understand, again, how they fit with the team and how, they, how they're motivated and how we communicate. What's probably most telling about this is when there's a problem or a challenge or somebody's feeling very uncomfortable because different traits t tend to accent at that point. And it helps you identify a way to approach them and to, to keep them as part of the team if they're uncomfortable. So. Did have a couple. Let's just put that down. Okay. Can we do that? That would be super. Okay, we, I did have a few comments that weren't necessarily on the slides, but as we embarked on this culture change, we did run into and I think almost every public agency has this issue um, where I, I can stand up so I can actually see some people being as short as I am. Um, I don't know what term you use in your organization, but they're always the people who've been around a long time. Um, whether you call them legacy employees or you know the grumpy old men in the corner, there was a reason that the movie was made about this, and they can be women too. But they're the people who are 
not so happy with the organization because whatever their personal ambitions have been or whatever their thoughts have been over the last 30 or 40 years, they haven't necessarily been addressed. So what do you do with that? What do you do with the people who aren't willing to embrace change, no matter how hard you push? And I think that it's a toolbox. Um, there are a lot of things you can do. For the um, average employee, you train them, you talk to them, you throw it into their um, annual performance evaluations, you provide them with some guidelines or even performance improvement plans. For the folks that are you know, one foot out the door anyway, we actually did a golden handshake program and said this might be the time. Uh, if you really don't want to jump on board this culture change, it might be the time. Um, but we've continued to trickle that down through everything we do. As I mentioned it, we do it with the employee of the month, but we also do it when we're uh, looking at, we say doing it, look at cultural opinions, attitudes, and opportunities when we are recruiting. So as we're sitting in those interview panels, we have a few questions. They might be hypothetical. They might be <coughs> whatever to try and find out how somebody would do something, whether they um, are really focused on achievement and performance or whether they're more um, on appearance and you know, just <coughs> trying to avoid doing something wrong. And you can get to that by some of those questions. We also do it during our um, not just recruitment, but also our promotional interviews so that the folks who have a more positive attitude are sometimes those who are promoted even over those who might have more experience or might have um, better basic skills, but we're trying to build a, a staff that has that as their attitude, if you will. Um, another thing we're doing to try and encourage folks to understand where they fit in is sometimes it's all in who's telling you. So um, I might say to somebody, hey, you, you really got to get on board. Your attitude isn't good in that. Oh, I don't need to take anything from you. You've only been at this organization five or six years. What do you know? Um, so we started doing more and more what we call 360 performance evaluations. And I don't know how many of you have done that. They can be extremely humbling and painful. Um, Basically, the people who work for you and your peers and your boss or bosses evaluate you. We do it um, in an online survey form so that it's anonymous. And for instance, I'm in the middle of mine right now. This can be excruciating. I haven't gotten them back yet. But um, almost 20% of the organization is invited to help evaluate me, if you will. And then um, those results are shared with the board because I'm a direct report to the board. And the board will also tell me where, you know, there were additional shortcomings that I need to work on or strengths. I can just hope, you know. But the point is that that, too, gives people an opportunity to give some of the managers feedback that they wouldn't otherwise hear. Because if I'm just evaluating one of the folks who works for me, I'm only seeing half of it. I'm seeing how they're interfacing with me, but I may not be so familiar with how they're interfacing or supporting their staff. And that's something that's being encouraged through the 360s. So we are, uh, to a certain level in our management structure, the man, uh, myself, the AGMs, and the, sec uh, the division managers are all having to go through 360s. From there down to the intermediate management, it's all um, optional. And some people are encouraged to because they aren't listening to their, super, their manager who says you're not being perfect. But And if it's obvious to everyone, then sometimes they take the word better. And that's where I was saying it depends on who you're hearing it from.